Looking ahead on September 10th, the time for our worship service will change back to 1030 a.m. This will allow time for the ladies and Mary and Martha Fellowship breakfast and meeting at 830 a.m. the Sunday school class at 930 a.m. September 10th will also be the first meeting of Alpha for teens that from meet evening from 5 to 7 p.m. And happy birthday to Aiden Russell on Thursday, August 31st. And it also feels like an invitation for us to be here today and to share with God any concerns, loving messages, or just um, the need to be in fellowship together. So I'm going to read um, verses 28 and 29. <coughs> Excuse me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Will you all join me, please, in our call to worship, as found in your bulletin, if you will read the bold print, and I'll get us started. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They eat ever praising you. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God then dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold 
for those who walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So today we are picking up the story of Samuel that we began two Sundays ago. Um, we talked about Hannah having poured out her grief about being childless and her desire to have a son to the Lord. And God answered her prayer by enabling her to have a baby boy. Yet, when Hannah made her bold request, she also made a vow that if God gave her the child that she asked for, she would give him back to the Lord as a Nazarite for his entire life. And that means he wouldn't have his hair cut by a razor, he wouldn't drink any beverages made with grapes, and to her it also meant that he was going to live in Shiloh near the tabernacle. So now here she is, a mother with baby in arms faced with another difficult situation. Will she be able to follow through with her vow and let Samuel go? She had counted on partnering with God in this endeavor, on their desires aligning so that the son that God would give her would be important in God's plan for all of Israel. And God's answer to her showed her yes. Our plans, our desires are in alignment. This is my will, and I do have something important to do in and through Samuel. But now it's up to Hannah and Elkanah whether or not to keep the vow. Elkanah, being the dad, does have a say in the matter. They're facing a test that's somewhat similar to Abraham. He waited so long for his son Isaac, and then God asked him to offer him back. God wanted to know of Abraham, and for Abraham to know of himself if the miracle baby that he'd been waiting for was more important to Abraham than his relationship with God. Hannah will need to make this choice too. And in truth, all of us make choices just like this. God gives us precious gifts. Our life, maybe a spouse, Possibly a child or children, grandchild, a lifelong friend, a home. Are any of these gifts more important to us than the giver? Do we receive them and then imagine that they are ours to have and to hold forever, that they belong to us? The reality of the situation is found in the song that we just sang. All that we have is God's alone, a trust from the Lord. So as long as God gives it into our care, we are stewards of that trust. As we listen to the passage this morning, I invite you to open your heart to the searching gaze of the Holy Spirit with the willingness to see if you are withholding anything and not dedicating it to the Lord. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, a ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. 
There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. The, bow, the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles, he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has taken inherent a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli, the priest. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. You might have noticed that Hannah is not the only one to make a vow. In verse 21, Elkanah went to Shiloh to offer the family's annual sacrifice and to fulfill his vow. He is following the instructions the Lord gave to all the people of Israel, and it's from Deuteronomy 12, verses 11 to 12, which say, Then to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name, there you are to bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, and all the choice possessions you have vowed to the Lord, and there rejoice before the Lord your God. Shiloh was a special place because it was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and that means that the mercy seat of God was there. They sensed the presence of God above the angel's wings that were on top of the Ark of Covenant. And Eli, Israel's high priest, also served there at Shiloh and lived near the sanctuary. He was there to teach the people about God and to help them in their making of sacrifices to the Lord. I looked up Shiloh's meaning in Hebrew, and it is, he whose it is, or he to whom it belongs. It also means tranquility or peaceful one. And I think this is very fitting because this is where Hannah found peace for her troubled spirit and where her family travels every year to return a portion of the gifts that God has given to them. We don't know exactly what Elkanah uh, vowed, but it was common for the father of a family to pledge a return of the first fruits of the crop and maybe firstborn of the herd if they had one to the Lord. And this sacrifice was one of thanksgiving and joy. You might remember from the other message a couple of weeks ago that only a portion of the animal was offered as a burnt offering, and the rest was given as a feast with portions of meat for all the family members and also the priests. 
but Hannah didn't want to go. She didn't go with um, the rest of the family to Shiloh because she wanted to stay home and have this time with Samuel. She, I think, just demonstrated some boldness in the way that she just announces to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live always there. At this time in history, it was common for a child not to be weaned until they were about three years old because they didn't have any refrigeration and that was a way for, to ensure that this child was getting um, healthy and sweet milk. So Hannah planned to cherish her three years with little Samuel and then let him live in the dwelling place of the Lord in Shiloh. She wasn't trying to find a way to get out of her vow. Did you notice that? There was a way. She could have appealed to Elkanah to kind of overrule her vow because in Numbers 30, verses 10 to 12, this is what the Lord gave instructions to the people saying, if a woman living with her husband makes a vow and her husband hears about it, but says nothing to her and does not forbid her, then all her vows will stand. But if her husband nullifies them when he hears about them, then none of the vows that came from her lips will stand. Her husband has nullified them and the Lord will release her. So she could have looked for the loophole and said, I got my child and now Elkanah, if you nullify my vow, I can keep him. <laughs> How often do we do that with the Lord? We're like, hmm, can you answer this present, this um, prayer request for me? And then God does and you intended to do something to praise God about that, and you're just like, hmm, maybe I can just forget about that. Maybe there's a way out of it. But Hannah was not thinking that way, even though what she promised was this precious baby boy she had longed for her whole life. Hannah didn't ask her husband to nullify her vow, and Elkanah didn't second guess her decision. Instead, he agreed with her and said, do what seems best to you. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. Hannah is respecting God, and Elkanah is respecting God and Hannah. Elkanah wants God's word to be the most important thing in all of their lives. Is it for us? They are trusting that God inspired this whole plan and that God will do something beautiful when they return their son to him. And this took a lot of faith because in some of the verses that we skipped over, we learn that Eli's sons have not grown up to be men of good character and faith. Elkanah and Hannah didn't know how it would turn out with Eli raising their precious son. So let's pause and think about our own lives here. First of all, have you ever vowed to give something that God has given you back to him. Maybe it was your own life. When we trust Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf and unite our life to his, it's a vow, it's a commitment. Jesus described it in this way in Matthew 10, 39. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life up for me, you will find it. Jesus didn't cling to his life. He gave it up for us. And when we accept that gift, we also give our life, the control of our life, over to him. And we pledge to follow him. Our life is no longer focused on pursuing our own happiness or importance. It's about fulfilling God's given promise for us, the, the purposes he created us to fulfill. It's about serving the Lord and following Jesus' example and listening to those promptings of the Holy Spirit who has come to live inside of us so that our actions and our choices bring glory to God. The Apostle Paul also wrote about this in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. He said, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God has bought you with a price, so you must honor God with your body. 
The bottom line is our life is not our own and neither are the lives of the people that we love. They belong to God and they are not ours to cling to or to control. When we let go of the ownership of our life and the lives of our loved ones, we trust God with all of it, with everything. In the case of our own life, God will partner with us in our decision making. This does not mean that we make decisions and God is obligated to bless every plan that we have and make it come about. What it does mean is that we are dedicated to actively seek and listen and follow God's will, to trust him and obey and follow through with his instructions and guidance. And this carries over to the lives of our spouse, if we have one, our children, our friends. We will have a part in caring for them, just like Hannah had for caring for Samuel. But ultimately, they belong to God, and they are only ever in our lives on loan from him. It is not easy to choose trust over control, but it does lead to the most real love and joy possible. Some of you know that one of the invitations God's been giving me lately is to accept that my husband travels for work and sometimes for other trips. And I prefer him to be home with me. But when he is gone, I'm starting to really embrace the opportunity to have more concentrated times just with the Lord and to enjoy them. Embracing this opportunity leads to joyful surprises. I'll tell you about them if you want in personal conversation. <laughs> but I trust the Lord that he will be there with me. He'll show up and I'll enjoy it. And I also trust the Lord with Matthew's life and both of our hearts, including our relationship. So I've grown in my faith and intimacy with God in new ways in my time alone with him. And I am increasingly letting go of my anxiety about Matt's safety when he's away from me and entrusting him to God's hands. Psalm 121 is a prayer that I pray over him and over myself, and you might want to check it out and make it part of your life too. So let's return to Samuel's story and see what happened for all of them when the time came. The three years was up and Hannah kept her vow and gave him to the Lord. It's really interesting to me that Hannah is the one described as bringing this huge sacrifice to the Lord. She's not just bringing her baby, but she's also bringing everything that goes with it, according to the scriptures of Numbers 15.8. She brings a three-year-old bull, a ten, 10 pounds of fine flour, and a skin of wine to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. I see Hannah being courageous and fully engaged. She's not passive. She's not despondent. She's not shutting down. We don't have to be so afraid of surrender and sacrifice. It actually stirs up the very best in us. Hannah's moving forward in trust that God has got this. She's going to be okay. Samuel will be okay. Her family will be okay. And even though this is the hardest thing any of them have ever done, it's going to be good. Hannah and Elkanah walk up to Eli, and it seems like she might have been pre preparing what to say. She says, pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. I just kind of wonder what Eli was thinking at this moment. I have this feeling, the way she said, pardon me, that he didn't see it coming. <laughs> he, he might be really shocked. Because four years earlier, he had asked God to give Hannah whatever it was she was praying for, but he didn't know what she was praying for. He didn't know it was a little boy, or that Hannah had promised to give him back to the Lord, and that meant she was going to give the baby to him. God was graciously giving Eli another chance to raise a boy to love the Lord, to respect God's holiness, and to learn how to serve God 
and lead the people in worship. He probably thought that ship had sailed, and he was grieved over what his children were doing. They were not respecting God's sacrifices or the people who came to worship. He has this other chance. The story of Hannah's brave gift and willingness to let go brought to mind my sister Elizabeth. Now, the beginning of the story of, of Elizabeth and the coordination with Hannah is not the same. Her pregnancy was not expected or asked for because she was just a freshman in college. But she was expecting a little boy, and the father had moved to a state far away and cut off all communication with her. So that Christmas, our family received a card in the mail from another family we knew from a long time ago who lived in the Midwest and were not able to have any children. They had adopted a little girl and a little boy, and they had this feeling, and they put it right in their Christmas card, that God was asking them to adopt another child and this one to have special needs. Well, Elizabeth read this card, and she began to have a feeling that this was God's invitation for her and for her baby. It was a very emotional time when it came time to have the baby born and to know what to do. There was no adoption agency involved, just two families who had made promises, kind of like a vow to each other. And Elizabeth gave birth to a little boy, and while they waited for the paperwork to go through, she, she had that baby in her arms, brought him home, and cared for him for a week. The Chapey family had a name picked out for this little boy, but it didn't seem like the right one to my sister, and they graciously allowed her to name him Matthew instead. And there was a grace surrounding everything as the two families each gave all they had in loving surrender. And we didn't know at the time that Matthew would grow up to be a person affected by autism. But he was right where he needed to be with a family who was willing to move to another state to give him the best care and therapy available to be mature enough to handle his journey and to support him. Elizabeth and the Chapies have remained close in relationship all of these years. Trusting God does not lead to a road that's easy, but it's one that's marked by joy. Hannah's path was also marked, marked by joy in the midst of her sadness. Her prayer spills out and it shows all the wisdom and perspective that she's gained by walking closely with the Lord through this very challenging season. Her heart is full of many emotions, but the first one that spills out is rejoicing. She sees how the Lord has lifted her out of despair and made her have an important part in the great plan of redemption. She's been delivered from a situation that seemed impossible to live with. And now she feels she's made it through to the other side. She knows that God is holy and he is the rock and foundation of her whole life. She attests to the foolishness of being arrogant because she knows that God hears everything we say and that our choices matter to him. She sees how God brings about reversals bringing the strong to their knees, lifting up the weak, causing the overindulgent to feel hungry, and feeding those who have been feeling hunger, giving children to those who have had none, and allowing those who did have children to taste grief. Hannah says, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. She is fully aware that life and death are in God's hands, and her words take on even greater significance when you think about what happened to God's son when he died and raised from the grave, defeating death. Poverty, wealth, humility, exaltation, all of these come from the Lord, and each one is a gift in its own way. Because God allows different circumstances into people's lives at different times 
but each circumstance is an opportunity and an invitation to draw close to him in trust. Being poor and having needs can actually prepare us to serve with wisdom and compassion when we're entrusted with positions of leadership. And to honor, to receive the honor that might come with those leadership positions, we know that it doesn't belong to us if God has raised us up. We can give it to the Lord freely. God guards the feet of his faithful servants and keeps us from falling. Those who oppose and rebel against the Lord, their maker, they're the ones who end up with broken, shipwrecked lives. And yet, even then, that makes them in a good position to be part of one of God's reversals because he never stops loving them. So forgiveness and restoration, a lifting up is always possible. God is the one who has the final say on our lives, not us or anyone else. Hannah finishes with this prophetic line, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Hannah and Elkanah's son Samuel will be the one entrusted with anointing the first and second of Israel's kings. And these two men will come from humble backgrounds and God will lift them up into leadership roles, and they will need to remember that the God of reversals will not give them a pass if they become proud and disobedient. Their lives, their callings, and every gift that God gives them will only remain holy and joyful if they walk close to the Lord and remember that they are dedicated to him. And the same is true for each of us. Do you want a holy and joyful life? Do you want to experience the peace that comes from having all of your decisions guided by the Lord? Nothing in this world can provide this most precious gift to you. Only God can. And it needs to flow back to him in trusting worship to remain vital in our lives. So after Hannah's big, immense, immense beautiful prayer, I've included a few um, verses that kind of give us a peek into what it was like for Samuel to be living there in, in the tabernacle. We learn that Elkanah and the family went home to Ramah, and I learned that that's about 15 miles from Shiloh. Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli's tutelage, and it's interesting, these little glimpses we get of even what he wore. He wore a linen ephod, which is a long, plain, sleeveless vest that's worn by all the priests. So he's like a little junior priest, and he has this like kind of a long apron-y thing on. And along with this, Samuel also wore a robe, a sleeveless garment that probably reached to his knees and was worn over the undergarment and under the ephod. So he's got these layers of clothes, and each one is significant. We get a glimpse of Hannah's ongoing love for Samuel because she makes and brings him a new robe every year when they go up for the annual sacrifice. I can imagine tears and love and prayers went into the making of each of these special robes, kind of like a prayer shawl. But unlike the robe that caused so much jealousy and division in Joseph's family, this robe was expressing Samuel's devotion to God, and it didn't threaten his other siblings and make them turn against him. Eli also blessed Elkanah and Hannah, asking the Lord to give them more children. And I noticed as I was looking in the bulletin that verse 21 didn't make it in there for some reason, so I'm going to read it to you now. The Lord was gracious to Hannah, and she gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Hannah, whose very name means grace, pleaded with God for just one son, and God gave her four sons and two daughters. I think this underscores the fact that we cannot outgive God. What a joyful life Hannah had, watching her son grow up, experiencing the favor of God in all the people. That verse that's used to describe Samuel is the very same one 
used to describe God's son in Luke 2. Hannah and God and Mary all share some profound connections in the story of God that stretches over thousands of years. And we're still part of that, fam that story here and now. What a privilege. Do you believe it? Do you see it? Does it affect the way you make decisions and help you want to dedicate your life and everything you have to the Lord? I'd like to conclude this morning with some words from Ron Hutchcraft. He wrote a devotional entitled, The Price of Withholding. His is a reflection on the Abraham and Isaac story found in Genesis 22, but I think it also relates to Hannah, Elkanah, and Samuel's story. Ron writes, God has a prior claim to that loved one you're holding onto so tightly. He made them. He paid for them. They're his. He has a prior claim to that house, that car, that possession that you may have hung on to for yourself. He has a prior claim to the money that you want to mostly spend on your kingdom instead of his. Yeah, God has prior claim to that position you hold or aspire to hold, to your gifts, to your talents, the opportunities he's entrusted to you. They're all his. He has a prior claim to your children. Could it be that you're withholding them from God? Are you hanging on to something or someone you love? You have plans. You have dreams and security riding on it. But God's hands are reaching your way saying, can you trust me with what you love so much? That's the invitation this morning. Would you pray with me? Dear God, you did not withhold anything from us. You give us all the goodness that we have in our lives, even our very selves. And you didn't withhold your son from us, but brought him to the earth, and he gave his life for us. Lord, help us to know that surrender can be joyful. It can bring us peace when we let go of control and live in harmony with your will and do so for your glory. It doesn't mean we'll give up all of our happiness. It means that we'll have a deeper happiness and we can trust you no matter what happens. Help us to enjoy both your gifts and you as the giver, Lord, as we worship you with our lives and our mouths. In Jesus' name, amen. Great are you, Lord, and mighty in strength. You are faithful, and you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands, all ye nations, shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Where you send us, God, we will go. You're the answer, we want the world to know. trust you when you call our name. Where you lead us, we'll follow all the way. Raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. We will pray for now and forever, how awesome is the Lord Most High. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
benediction with you. May your hearts be wholly devoted to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as you are doing today. May God fill you with the knowledge of his will, with all the wisdom and understanding that his spirit gives, and then you will be able to live as the Lord wants and will always do what pleases him. Amen.